All right. Assalamu alaikum. I send you all greetings of peace as in the Muslim tradition and welcome you all to this very special seminar with some fantastic guests. We've got, we've got quite a mixed audience this afternoon and welcome you all. I'll introduce myself first. So I'm Tala Damra and I'm part of the youth community of the Muslim Women's Sports. Uh, without any further delay, I'm going to introduce our fantastic speakers as we look forward to learn from their extensive experience. So first, we have the awesome Khadija Digg. So Khadija is a mother, project manager, and a Team USA and Silver Ironman all-world triathlete. Khadija is currently ranked in the top 5% of her age group by Ironman Triathlon. Her mission is to promote positive image of Muslim women and Islam in general through triathlon. Khadija's goal as an athlete has been to change the world, one race at a time. Now, as, as a USA triathlon certified coach, she would like to expand and share that mission as a mentor and coach by three athletes every year, with the intention that they will also pay it forward to exponentially create positive change through the sport of triathlon, through the 501 C3 program, diversity, infusion, and syndicate. And we also have the amazing uh, speaker here today, Samira Asghari. Samir Azbari is the first ever member of the mem of the International Olympic Committee Forum uh, from Afghanistan since 2018. Upon her election at the age of 24, Samira became the youngest ever member to join the IOC. She has been playing for Afghanistan's women's national basketball team since 2009 and is the former captain of the team. She is a civilian human rights activist advocate for women and youth empowerment through sport. She's one of the founders of Afghanistan's Peace and Sports Council, a volunteer for the ARCS, which is Afghanistan's Red Crescent Society, Youth and Sports Department since 2012, and a former member of the Women's Sports uh, Committee, which is the Olympic Council of Asia. She's the award winner of the top 10 women from the UN Afghanistan and is sports administrator with 10 years of professional experience and is national and international nonprofit organization. Additionally, she has worked as an internal audit admin staff for the chief executive office of the IR of Afghanistan during the 2010s. Her background is in international relations. She has studied political science in Afghanistan and currently is a master in sports administration and technology at AISTS in Switzerland. So we welcome you both. Uh, and now before like, we get started with the panel, like please remember this is an interactive session and we'd love to have questions from all of our audience as well. Just go ahead and place them in the live chat and we'll look to get to them as soon as we can. Um, so I will start with my questions. Uh, I will go ahead with Khadija. So I want to ask you first, could you tell us what you got into, uh, what got you into competing in the triathlon? What do you love about the triathlon? And why is it important to encourage women to join it? Um, I did my first triathlon as part of an, initi an initiative for um, the sorority that I belong to, which is Gamma Gamma Chi Sorority Incorporated. Um, it was just, supposed to be a one and done. It was something fun to do. Um, and the day that I did it, it was all women's race. And I just, I enjoyed myself immensely. I came in third to last, <laughs> but I enjoyed myself immensely. And um, I signed up for several more. And I, I, I've been doing it ever since I was hooked from day one. Um, what I love about triathlon is there's always something to work on. And I also fell in love with the community. Um, even though there aren't very many African Americans participating in the sport and even fewer Muslims, um, I got a lot of support. I, I got a lot of pushback and I got a lot of mean things happen to me, but the core of what I received from it was, was love. And it also gave me an opportunity. It was something for myself. I know a lot of women as, as mothers, you do for others, you work you're always concerned about your children, that space and time when I'm training and when I'm racing, that's that's something that's just for me. So I got more out of it just than just fitness. Uh, friendships that I probably never would have made. Um, I've traveled places that I probably never would have traveled to. Um, over the past couple of years, I mean, I've been to Dubai, South Africa, um, to the Caribbean, 
uh, Canada, just traveling all over the place, meeting new people and doing things that I probably wouldn't have done. And even it introduces me to things that I probably wouldn't have done outside of triathlon. I love to kayak now. I started kayaking, supporting other swimmers as they train. Um, I just returned from West Virginia to um, a camping uh, gathering uh, where I was a guest speaker and uh, they had rock climbing, they had mountain biking, they had this contraption where you just climb. So it was it was fun. And I'd, I'd never, believe, believe it or not, I'm, I live in the United States. I had driven through West Virginia. I had been to a track meet in West Virginia, but I had never seen West Virginia. So it's a great opportunity just to see the world on your bike. And I just, I love the sport. I love the people. I love what I get out of it. And I love what I'm able to give. And it's, it's also been an opportunity opportunity for Dawa. Uh, I think it shocks me because of where I grew up in New York, that there's so many people who have never met a Muslim woman. And they have all of these set expectations about how we should be and how we should behave. And I like to crack jokes and I don't think, I don't think they, they expected that from me, you know, I'm really silly. So it's, it's just the camaraderie, um, the ability to have time just for me and it, it took me out of a, a space where I probably would have stayed and I don't want to go back. And I want, I really want that for other women. That is so inspiring. Could you tell us more like about your hijab and what it means to you and how did it play a role in your career? Uh, were people accepting uh, of it? Um, how do people react? What, and what does it mean to you? Yeah. Um, at first, people weren't accepting. Um, I converted to Islam, um, and at first I didn't cover. Uh, and then I kind of gradually eased into it. But what I noticed was um, how people spoke to me was different when I had my hijab on versus when I had my hijab off, especially, um, especially men. Um, I got a sense of freedom out of it. And once I decided to start wearing hijab full time, um, I didn't want to take it off. It just, it, it, it just gave me a sense of confidence in myself as a human being, not what I looked like, not what my hair looked like. Um, so that, that's really what it means to me. Just, just a sense of confidence and a sense of, of just me. I know a lot of people look at, look at it who aren't Muslim, look at it as a form of, oppression. There's a there's a choice. I mean, it says in the Quran you should cover, but there's a choice as to whether you wear your hijab or not. And I know amazing Muslim women who don't wear hijab. I know some not so nice Muslim women who wear hijab and, you know, you, they might as well take it off. So it's, it's different for every woman. It's very personal. And I don't think that we should be judged as to whether we wear it or not or how we wear it. Um, I think hijab is more, and, and I'm no Islamic scholar, but I think hijab is more in your heart and in your behavior and how you treat others than anything else. Right. Um, this is like so inspiring um, to like be, be able to like wear whatever we want without like having people judge whether we want to do it or not. Um, and people talk about like the freedom of wearing whatever we want, like girls, but then judge women who just directly assume that they're oppressed because of their job or whatever. Um, so now I'm going to ask, like, Samira, uh, we know that your journey started with playing many sports, but then developing mainly in basketball. From playing in Afghanistan, despite some unstable conditions, being the captain to being the member of Afghanistan's women basketball team, tell us more about your basketball journey first and what it meant to you to play at difficult times in Afghanistan and beyond. Thank you for the question, Tala. Uh, well, actually, uh, when I started sport, it was at early age. I started swimming when I was five years old, and then uh, martial arts when I was seven years old, and uh, also playing randomly football with my older brothers and being uh, the goalkeeper. And also, at the age of 14, I started playing basketball in Afghanistan from high school. Uh, and then uh, because the system is uh, that they select girls uh, for the youth national team or the adult national team from high school. So I was elected for the youth uh, national team 
uh, when I was uh, 14. Uh, and then um, gradually, um, in when I was 18, I became, uh, um, I was in the uh, national uh, adult team. I played for the national adult team, team uh, before I come here. So for me, uh, it was in the beginning, uh, just uh, because I was a young girl, I wanted to be active physically because before I used to be active. So, but at the end, uh, I felt that this can be something to help others. And it started from high school, uh, inspiring other girls to do sport. Because when I felt that now I'm in a society, which is my society, Afghanistan, and it's uh, extremely conservative, especially after um, the Taliban regime was ruling this country for a while, for, for, many, for many years. So it was really difficult to convince other girls and families to allow their girls and daughters to play sport. But at the same time, for me, it was passion from the very beginning. And uh, now when I remember every step and every stage, it was a fight, fight internally, fight with the society, fight with the neighbor, fight with the relatives and defending other girls, encouraging them by all these obstacles that we had. So it, it, uh, later on, it was kind of a, a goal and a tool for me to, to encourage others to be their self and to do what they like, and especially sport in Afghanistan, because Afghanistan is a war-tour country. So how we could unite at least these youth, young people, uh, women or men, it was a sport, an easy tool, but difficult to implement it. So my journey started from basketball and inspiring other girls and uh, maybe because I had the courage, because I had a good family behind me, a supportive uh, family, brothers, uh, that they, they, they never counted me as a daughter to be, or girl to be always at home or not to do this or to do that or sit this way or go that way. No, they were really supportive. So they encouraged me to encourage others and to, to, to be voice of others. And I'm really proud of that since that time till now. So uh, I wanted to ask you, um, is, it, is it that your parents and family were from the beginning very supportive of women playing sports or is it something that developed over time because of your passion? Or how did it come about, like um, your family being different than other families in Afghanistan? Um, so if you can tell us like more about that. Uh, to be honest, my family themselves, they are, um, they're educated. And also it's important that they know their kid, like they know their daughter, how is she? Because uh, in Afghanistan, they believe that, okay, if girls, they go out and they communicate a lot in society, especially and they do sport, they will not be the good girl. And I, I'm sure that people understand what I mean, especially those who, who have been facing these situations themselves. So for me, because my family, they trusted me and they knew me because they raised me. So they, 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 they knew that Samira, she can be a role model for others. And we will be supporting her in order that she can support others. So it was because my parents, they were educated. My brothers, they were supportive. And because I had the trust, I achieved the trust from them to, mm -hmm. to support me. That's so inspiring um, and good to hear. Um, so we've seen your work about advocating for women to play basketball in Afghanistan. Tell us more about how did you encourage women, like the mechanisms to, of, of encouraging more women in Afghanistan to play sports in general. Um, and what do you think were the restrictions that are letting like families um, to not let them play, specifically like women? And yeah. Um. In the beginning, it was difficult. In the beginning, why it was difficult? Because myself, I was young. Like, I didn't know really the rules of the sport. We were listening to whatever the coach, um, you know, the manager. 
the national uh, federation president, all the officials, they were telling us. But at the same time, I understood that uh, it should be different. It's not the way that they are treating the athletes. And how could I, how could I uh, transfer this message to my fellow teammates? I, I had to have a good behavior. I had to be a role model for, for them to support me and to, to understand what it, what it really means to, to be a sport woman or sport man. And for me, it was difficult because even inspiring others, it's not just by sitting and telling your story or, you know, especially in Afghanistan, I'm speaking. So I had to, I had to ha have action. Like whenever, whatever I say, I believe I should have to take it in consideration to to have an action and to do it by inspiring them. That's that's t uh, telling that uh, you will have you will you will you will go forward to another better stage if you uh, practice well. For example, basketball. If you do this, you will be better. If you be united, you will do better. If you have um uh, uh kindness to your teammate you will you will be a, they will like you like if there was any dispute between the team or the the teams with the national federations i was the one that tried to resolve the conflict in a neutral way in a way that to lead them to be united and it wasn't just within the basketball federation i was very lucky to work for the national olympic committee and also ministry of sport to be to, to to tell them to show them that see i was your teammate and now i'm here you should also be here one day by 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 enriching your knowledge by by investing on yourself otherwise you're not you cannot help others if you are not you yourself educated if you don't know the rules if you don't know the rights and responsibilities so it was also difficult because of uh, the relatives, the families that they didn't want to uh, their daughters or girls to, to, to be in sport. So for myself, my personal experience, I was cut off from with relatives. After I joined sport, I said bye to my relatives because they were not liking me anymore, saying so she, she went to sport, now she is not the good girl that uh, she ha have to be so for, for me it was difficult it was obstacle emotionally and mentally and also of course fighting within with the system the current system that we had by the time and still it's the same that uh, even internally within the national olympic committee ministry of sport they were still having the uh, beliefs that okay if these girls are coming to sport they're not from the right families otherwise they wouldn't allow them to go so it's everyday fight in it's just. such an immense power to um like stand against uh such discrimination and explain to people why is it like it's it needs such immense power and it's really it should it shouldn't have been this way but uh to need such an immense power to like stand against people um against women playing sports and then if a girl plays sports they see her as an outsider more like something that is not the norm uh it's very sad and saddening to hear about those stories um know how immense the restrictions are um so i'm gonna ask khadija digs now a question uh we know that in 2016 triathlon you were the first hijabi to represent team usa and then you've made the movement called the diversity infusion syndicate by Khadija, tell us more about your goals and methods of encouraging more Muslim women in sports to compete on such grand levels like the ones you're competing on. Um, one of the things that um, I was really excited about is the fact that in the last national championships of the multi-sport festival that happened in 2019, um, quite a few more African-Americans made the team um, when I made the team in 2016, there was one gentleman and myself and another young lady in the Aquathlon, and that was it. Um, the, this past national championships, I believe there were 17 African-Americans.
Americans, but there were no other hijabis. And that really, um, that really bothered me. Um, so I made a purposeful, not just talk about it, but I made a purposeful action to a call to bring Muslim women in um, and to get them to um, maybe look at triathlon seriously. One of the things that I noticed in, in the sport of triathlon, especially amongst women, Muslim women, African-American women specifically, it, there's no lack of inspiration out there. There are people that we can look to, whether they be African-American or not, that inspire us. And even outside of the sport of triathlon, what was missing was the opportunity to have consistent coaching, to have that hands-on mentoring, uh, especially from another woman, and especially from another Muslim woman. I don't know of any other Muslim uh, tri female triathlon coaches. So that's why I made the call for that. And what I've done, and it's not just me, I have a team of people, people who have been in my life since I started doing triathlon. They have a swim specific coach, a run specific coach. I do the cycling and the, the overall plan for their training. And we have another gentleman who is a very experienced level two coach, uh, Coach Ahuja, who does training camps. We had a training camp recently in, the, um, in April, and we'll have another training camp um, in August. And the intention is to give them the tools and the confidence and the knowledge, just like Samira said, having the understanding and the knowledge is so important because you can't be prepared to give to others until you've been prepared yourself. So what I did was I, I purposely, that my sole intention for getting my coaching certification was to start this program. Even though I'm an experienced triathlete and I've been fed by all of these amazing coaches, I wanted to make sure that I had all of the knowledge that I could consume to give to them. And my goal is to give them everything that I have, not just the, the training from, the, from getting my coaching certification, but everything I went to from visualizing all the good things and the bad things that can happen in a race. Um, and all of the obstacles that you'll have as, as an African-American and separately, because it's very different. I received different feedback as a Muslim and different feedback as an African-American woman. They have to realize these are the things that are gonna happen to you. This is how I've overcome them. Use what's inside of you to overcome them. I, I had a young lady who I connected with um, about a year and a half ago. She's primarily, primarily a cyclist, but she wants to get into triathlon. She is doing a, a tour uh, out in Wisconsin and she called me yesterday and she, she the things that had happened, I don't even want to go into details about what happened to her, but she called, she's like, how have you dealt with this? I said, look, I almost, almost felt like I hadn't prepared for what was going to happen. These are the things that will happen to you. But always remember, and I told you this, not to brag that I won a race. I said, but nobody cared about my hijab till I won a race. I said, and that didn't happen till I was four years in the game. You should be proud. You've only been cycling a year and they're already at you. So the, that's that's what, what it's all about. It's about taking everything that I've gained from book knowledge to experience to the coaching training, packaging it all up and giving it to them and kind of in a one year crash course and then bringing another crew of women in and doing the same thing and hoping that it's not just an experience about sport, it's an experience about self-confidence that they can take anywhere. They can do something like Samira and be a member of the IOC and be confident that they understand their sport and they have confidence in themselves because they've already received that, that negative feedback, that racism, whatever it is from all over and still be a positive, positive light in whatever they do. I really like the idea that you said um, you can't like give to people until like you're also prepared, uh, which like makes makes like women leaders that are prepared like you and Samira very important to set role model to give back, um, which both of you are really doing on great scales, representing Muslim women in sports in such high fields. Um, so I wanted to ask Samira now, like, you're currently finishing your master's degree from the International Academy of Sports 
uh, science and technology. Uh, tell us more about how is this degree helping you achieve your long-term goals? Uh, so you can talk a little bit more about like, what are your long-term goals and how is your master's degree helping in that? Um, and like, how's your experience uh, in Switzerland and all that? Thank you, Tala. For me, from a very young age, I, as I remember, I always believed in education. And, 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 and the only thing that I really impressed me is uh, education. If I stand in front of a professor, I will be really humble to, to listen. Um, so yeah, um, I was really interested to do my master in sport, uh, to, to look at uh, sport differently because it's good that I have a lot of experience playing for the national team, playing with the grassroots uh, team from starting from high school and then working with the National Olympic Committee and then working with the Olympic Council of Asia, which is the governing body of uh, Olympic uh, in the Asia continent. And also working with the IUC since 2014 uh, as an athlete on Tourish Commission member. So all these experience in the field of play and also in administrative part, for me, they were good, but I wanted to, to know more and to, to do my master in sport, to have a different perspective, because it's always good to, to have a, a support, uh, which is the education is the best for that. And how it can help me, uh, it already helped me, to be honest. And I always say that I'm blessed that I'm here and I'm studying uh, in ASTS. It's a really good university. And for me, uh, the most important thing is that I could do after long time and to have a good and to take a good deep breath was uh, encouraging uh, the national federations in Afghanistan uh, to have more women, not just in the field of play, but also in administration part. So I started this from uh, Afghanistan National Basketball Federation. That's my federation. I know what's happening in there. So uh, last year, um, we wrote a complaint later to the National Federation that we don't see any women in the administration and offices. What's going on? If you're going to report to the IF, to the International Federation, that's your job. And that's the communication between you and them. But we here as an athlete, we want to have more women to, to work for, for not, not just for women, but of course for, for men as well. And my long-term goal would be this, to educate, to let the girls understand that they are not the one who have to look at the, uh, you know, the authorities to the men like this that who that they they have to be the listener. No, yes, they should be the listener to listen uh, to the education, to listen that I'm listening daily in school in uh, uh, university here, doing my master. So my long term goal is to educate women to have more than uh, now in administration part, which is very, very important in sports especially. So they can be the leaders. They can have the authority. Why they should be the listener always. And I'm really sick of this. That uh, So for this, yeah, this is my goal and how I can expand it. I'll do my best as I did till now. It was really difficult. Sometimes they would have told me, some of my colleagues, They'll tell me, Samira, if we were instead of you, especially in Afghanistan, we would have given up already because it was really frustrating for me. So, but the happy thing is that I came up and I looked at the IUC and the Olympic movement that they're also struggling the same. It's not just like Afghanistan. No, no, the world is, everything is the same on the big page. So, but the good thing that Olympic, you know, Olympic movement, they're really looking after this, that how they can encourage other girls and women to do this sport and to, to expand it within the community. So this also encouraged me and drive me to, to, to be uh, enthusiastic to, to work with the IUC. And uh, because we have the common goal, that inspired me. The common goal now in, in IUC is also for athletes to know their rights and dis, uh, responsibilities. Because this was the thing that I was working in uh, inside Afghanistan, and I had no idea it's going on in uh, IOC. And that really and that really inspired me, Samira, maybe you can be the one. Because you're you're in Afghanistan 
and you didn't know about these things, but they're working on that in a very top level. So then I said, well, you can. And uh, yeah, for me, it will be to have more girls doing sport and freely as a human uh, to be working within the sport and have more power and authority. I'm, I'm very sure, and I, I can even guarantee that more women, we will have more strong uh, association and organizations and the world at large. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we really lack Muslim, um, like Muslim women leaders, especially um, in sports and in many, many areas, whether it's in Afghanistan or in the IUC, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it's it's really important to encourage leadership to, uh, to make in, to put pressure on institutions to allow more women to take those leadership positions and not to keep on excluding them uh, as they have been historically. Um, so when I talk on a different note for Khadija, um, we wanted to ask you, like, uh, since you're like you're an athlete on the field, how has training schedules been affected during the pandemic? How did you adjust? Uh, we've seen that you've done some um, nutrition content. You've added some nutrition content over Instagram. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, the I think the pandemic threw everybody um, for a loop. Um, I was like everyone, my entire life changed. I started working from home 100%. Um, I have previously been working from home two days a week. Um, I have two very young children who started uh, homeschooling. Um, I, I wanted to start homeschooling them anyway, so that kind of jump started that. But I am, um, from a training perspective, I am ridiculously fortunate. Um, I built in my backyard what everybody calls the swim can. Uh, I couldn't afford an endless pool, so I kind of built one. <laughs> so I had some place to swim. Um, I have a kicker, which is basically a bike simulator. So I'm able to ride any course in the world from my home, and I have a treadmill, and you know I can run. I could run outside. So my training, my ability to train, wasn't really taken away from me. Group training, of course, was taken away, um, but it impacted me from just a mental health perspective, what's going on. Um, I'm very close to my family, especially my father um, to this. I have, I still haven't seen my father since the pandemic started. We intend to get together uh, shortly, but I wanted to make sure that everyone was vaccinated. I think here in the United States, it's actually a little bit easier because um, vaccines are so readily available. Um, I'm not able to travel internationally. As a lot of people know, I. I have friends and family in, in Cuba and I travel there frequently. I haven't been able to get there. Um, and I still, um, I'm not able to get there because the quarantine period is a week. And I usually don't have too much more than a week or 10 days to spend there. Um, but I, fortunately I've been able to continue to train um, the athletes that I'm coaching. Um, I've fortunately been able to be vaccinated. So we were able to do a training camp. Um, but after being in a mask for so long and being separated so long, even going to the race, I did my first race um, not too long ago. I it was I was stressed um, at the start of the race. A lot of them, most of the athletes didn't have masks on. I still had my mask on, and there was no trash can to throw my mask away. So I kind of just shoved it in a volunteer's hand and jumped in the water. So it's it's it's. I think it's more so taken a toll from a mental perspective. Um, it did give me a break from training and it did give me an opportunity to work on disc. So um, I'm a true believer because I've seen it in my life repeatedly and repeatedly. Allah doesn't take anything away without bringing something better. Um, a, a, a year of racing was taken away from not just me, but from everybody. But I think it gave all of us an opportunity to to rethink our relationships, to value uh, the time that we spend from family and also looking at some of the things that we do really aren't that important. You know, we need to look at look at those things, but the, the training continues. Um, it, it looks a little bit different. Like I said, less group training, but I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. There's some people who for months weren't able to get into the pool. So for me, it's, it's, it's been okay. And I'm, I'm truly uh, grateful for that. And, 
for being a little bit handy and <laughs> thankful to all the people that helped me, you know, build the, the pool in the backyard. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit more about like the nutrition aspect of your Instagram, like what are your interests yeah. in like nutrition? What are you so I, I'm a borderline diabetic. Um, I come from basically all the, the risk groups. Um, I've been able to keep my A1C, which is kind of the marker that they use to determine whether you're diabetic or not in a normal range. Um, I work with a company called F2C Nutrition. I started working with them by chance after, a actually in the middle of the, um, the my first ITU World Championships. I made a comment about the fact that because I was doing two events for one of them, I didn't use nutrition because I was concerned for the long event, my sugar was going to spike. And I started talking with the gentleman who owns the company and never do this, but I, I did it. I trashed my nutrition and I started using a new nutrition right in the middle of the race. And I felt great. I felt great for the first time after I raced. I usually felt sick because my blood sugar would spike. So I, I, I during the pandemic, I took the time to get some people together to to share what I had learned, to share some basics about good nutrition in general. I know there's a lot of talk out there about being on a keto diet or being on a juice diet. I'm a true believer in the fact that just eating healthy foods in moderation, basically eating according to what's in the Quran is, is what's best for you. Um, so I wanted to share that with everyone and to share my journey as someone who is pre-diabetic and to let them know that athletes aren't this, these superhuman people. We're just, we're, we, we are you. We just chose to do something, something different. So that's, that's what the, the, the podcasts are all about. And we had a podcast about just getting through the pandemic. I think that's a good one for, for people to listen to, to give ourselves grace. Oh, through this through this pandemic, because everybody is adjusting differently. So, yeah, I had I had a lot of fun, and I, I it's funny I got more out of it than I think the people who joined. Just I it was it was a fun time. It was an amazing time, and I actually go back and look at parts of the the videos sometimes myself. Yeah. Oh, that's like very uh interesting to hear that you got a lot out, out of it out of doing like podcasts uh, uh out of talking about nutrition i think a lot of people are concerned with nutrition now uh like what's the best diet whatever how our athletes like we, at least we think of them as like perfect uh bodies uh like they know what they're doing all the time um so yeah that was, that was interesting yeah um, his name was Cookie Monster. I used to love cookies. I just, <laughs> it is what it is. But you know, you just have to be conscious of what you eat and have a clear understanding of, of, of your body. And like I said, everything in, in moderation. I don't believe, I, and I, I, I don't even like the word diet. I look at it as nutrition and fueling. Fueling is for the race and nutrition is for your overall health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting perspective to look at it, uh, feeling and nutrition. Um, so I wanted to ask Samira now about like, could you tell us more about like, what do you hope to achieve uh, through the IOC? Um, like, what are your the main goals that you're doing right now uh, in the IOC, and how do you plan like to use IOC to encourage uh, and help Muslim women in sports in general? Um, well, for me, because uh, I was myself uh, exposure to to very difficult time as an athlete, and really, sometimes I say that the faded hope uh, that I really experienced. Now I really care for the athletes, and it doesn't matter which gender, to be honest, because we cannot say that it's just the the girls that they have a problem. There is men that the authorities uh, and those who have the power, they discriminate them and uh, they don't really uh, get what is their right and what they deserve. And I was witness uh, with my own eyes. So for me, it's always the welfare of the athletes uh, to work on that, 
to support it. And the best place to do it is in the IUC, within those who rule and make the rules uh, for athletes. And well, I think the good thing is that IUC themselves uh, in the last decade, uh, they're trying to have more youth engagement and to have more youth and especially women to, uh, to be within the movement to work and they empower them. Uh, in, Ag in the Olympic Agenda 2020, which now recently we have the Olympic Agenda 2020 plus five, uh, which is our roadmap, the IUC's roadmap, uh, roadmap uh, uh, to the next five years. We achieved really the goal to have more women in the executive board, which is very important. And IUC as an uh, IUC members, so the good thing is that it, it drives me more that I see that this movement itself is going toward the goal that every athlete wants uh, to, to, to have it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, for now, for me, it's um, to, 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 to work in the current uh, commissions that I'm a member. For example, all IUC members, they are definitely member of some uh, working groups and commissions that they work toward all the strategic plans that we have. So now I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, to, to be more active, uh, to, to do my best, the knowledge that I gained from ASTS, from my masters, and all these things, to implement it as soon as possible, as quick as possible, and as efficient as it can be. Uh, and the overall goal and aim, again, especially for the woman, uh, Muslim woman, is to be, um, to, to have the courage, to be brave. Just uh, this, uh, the day before yesterday, I was playing basketball here in Luzon, uh, randomly with other girls, and I saw uh, two Muslim women, and uh, they were not moving as they should move, like a sport person, like an athlete. So yeah, this is almost my daily daily work to tell them move like an athlete. You don't need to be like why you're walking this way. And I'm really really distracted in these things, and I'm really good pressure. So yeah, I'm happy, and I see really a bright future not only for Muslim women but also for the athletes overall. And um, I'm sure that by educating them and letting letting them know that um, they can be the best of them. Uh, it will really help them. I believe that because I did it. I did it. I in in Afghanistan. You asked me earlier that how you encourage other girls. It was also by having a good behavior. It's very important. I was the captain, so before prior that I was uh, the captain of the team. But they were listening to me more than that. They were listening to the coach. She was an old woman, and I really respect her. She she was the best. She was like my mother. But it really needs energy. And we, as a youth athletes and youth leader, we can do it. We can push them uh, in a good way, in a right way. I always say this. If you are, you are sure that you're doing the right thing, then uh, you, will be, uh, you will have the success at the end. So the, the overall uh, uh, goal is to support them in any way, from the basketball court just nearby to the, to the world. And this is, this is what we can do. I think these little, little steps, they're going to make change. I believe in that. So, uh, like, are you working on one commission? You said, like, there's different commissions and each commissions, like, obviously have goal, uh, different goals and um, different, like, things to do. So what is the commission, like, type, the one you're working in is called? And, like, what is its main goal? Uh, well, the, the first commission within the IUC that, that I was appointed as a member, it was the Athletes uh, Entourage Commission, um, which I'm really happy to be a member of that commission because, uh, because all the members that uh, we are in the commission, they, have, they came from different backgrounds. Some of them, they are the judge, some of them, they are uh, the doctor, some of them, they are trainers, some of them, they are the coach, some of them, they are the athletes. So it's very different but of course the, the entourage and our our goal is to to work um in closely with the athlete commission so iuc has many commissions and we have also athlete commissions 
So we work together to, to tackle the obstacle, to solve it, to put new inputs, to modify if it's needed. So it's very diverse, like everybody's involved and everybody. And, and, and the good thing is that it's very good atmosphere. Like everybody uh, has the right to say whatever they want to engage and it doesn't matter. And it's very, very nice that I hear uh, Tekla from uh, athletes uh, refugee team. Uh, we also have her in our commission. For example, she comes suddenly and talks about what's happening in North Africa, what's happening in Africa and the, the different things that ha is happening there. Sometimes for, for developed countries, it's like really it's happening there and we are all working together to 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 solve it and to be really flexible and it's really good so i can say that the movement itself is on the right track and uh, it's different in different uh, and, I, and i'm a member of different commissions so we are working with different different commissions and, and we are really trying our best this is a message that i can uh, frankly deliver we're proud of the work you're doing uh we're very glad like that uh, people are involved and everyone's voices matter in the IEC, some IEC's commission. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, Khadija a little bit um, about like the recent, you said being Muslim and being uh, African-American are two different things and obviously two things that you um, have to deal with um, because of people's like um, opinions and comments, whatever. Um, so we wanted to ask you about like the Black Lives Movement, it's a recent movement. So what does the Black Lives Movement mean to you since like it's an empowering movement for African Americans? Um, so how does this translate also like as your, like how does the Black Lives Movement relate to your experience as Muslim women? And what does, what does the Black Lives Movement mean to you overall and any other movement that's similar? Um, I'm, I'm excited about it um, because I think it's energized people who in the past have been complacent. Um, and I think the level of energy and the sphere of influence that it, it's been impacting, um, I think it's awoken the majority. I think they're, they're, they're aware that um, they can change, try to change the voting laws any which way but left and we're going to sit down and read them and make sure that we show out and force and vote um i think people have been energized to let everyone know that spaces that we haven't taken up we intend to take up with confidence um i just i my only prayer is that um it's consistent and and it's ongoing it's not just a thing for right now. Um, like I said, the, the, the term diversity and inclusion and equity, it, they're, they're being used a lot and they're being used in a lot of different spaces. I, I don't want this to be a, a single moment in time. I, re I really want it to be something that, that, that's ongoing and, and not to say that, you know, okay, now all of a sudden we start discriminating against white people. No, I just, I want people to see people as people. And I think that's, that's important. It, I, I just think it's a, it's an opportunity to to open up spaces to to everyone. Yeah, and my and my experience as a Muslim and as a Black person have been different. I've received discrimination from Black people because I am Muslim. So it's 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 it's, it's an, and then I've received discrimination from Muslims who don't consider themselves to be people of color because I'm Black. So it it puts it's it's in a it really puts you uh, in an awkward space. It kind of forces you to almost be uh, an ambassador for everyone, and that's a lot to carry. It's a lot to carry sometimes, but you 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 have to to carry it um, with grace. And and um, for me, I don't know if it's the same for everyone. I lean towards my faith first. Um, my skin is just the wrapping that I'm in. My soul is forever. So I, lean, I always lean towards my faith first. 
and then of course you know my culture so it's it's, it's an interesting time it's 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 uh yeah i'm i'm anxious to, I, when i'm an old lady i want to be able to look back and say i remember when you know <laughs> so yeah right well it's kind of a saddening like how people that are themselves are undergoing like discrimination um don't understand other people like other groups that are also going undergoing discrimination i feel like minorities should understand different groups of minorities like or uh even if they're not minorities like different groups that are being discriminated upon they should understand others um, yeah and I tell this story, I tell this story often. My roommate for the past two world championships was a young lady named Kathy Bowman. She is white, blonde hair, blue eyes. Her she's descendant of, I believe she's Scottish and German. When we got to our our flat where we were staying, we both called our family, we checked in on work emails, we got our kits together, and then we joked and laughed about what how we're gonna kill it on the race. If you peeled off our skin and ignored our background, we're the exact same. We were the exact same person. Mm -hmm. We're more the same and different. And I think as human beings, we need to look at the things that are the same about us and feed off of that, and then get an opportunity to share and enjoy and appreciate the things about us that are different. That was a learning lesson for me. It was literally an epiphany. And, and I just started giggling. She asked me why I was giggling. I was like, we're the same person. We're literally the same person. We were mothers who were checking on our children. We were professionals who wanted to make sure that we hadn't forgot it, but that one last email before we left the office. And we were athletes who are passionate about the sport that we love. We got the opportunity to represent our countries and we wanted to go out and show off. Right. Um, definitely what you said is like very correct and inspirational. Um, so I wanted to ask like both of you, um, uh, maybe you would begin with Mira, since like this is coming to an end, like what are um inspiration comments, like final comments you wanna like give the audience, give tell to Muslim women, tell to the world, um just like your final comments overall, um relating to our theme of inspiration. Well, I think uh, my message to all, always my message is that first of all, if you feel and if you understand that this is the right thing that you can do, of course, for others, for you, it's always the right thing that you do for yourself because you never want to put yourself in the wrong place. But if you feel that you are doing the best of you uh, for others, do it with faithfully. Uh, my message will be to be faithful, first of all, and then patient, and of course, enrich and invest on yourself to be able to help others. And uh, the unity piece was always my message for Afghans, for my country, because we have really internal conflict and war from outside, of course. So my message is always to think of solidarity and unity because that, at the end, will have a, a positive answer and resolve the things and keep you going forward. Otherwise, it's not going to work for nobody. So unity and peace and uh, to be faithful and also, of course, definitely be patient. Nothing can, in, with immediate time, it cannot be solved or it will be changed. But being patient and understand that you're doing the right thing. So that really will at the end, make something. Oh, and oh, these are the events of final. Um, I want to tell women, don't wait. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till you lose weight. Don't wait till you graduate. Don't wait till this happens. Do it now. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone, any of us. Um, and just to feed off of what Samira said, um, sportsmanship is everything. Always have the best of manners in, in anything that you do, um, and 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 share who you are. Um, I'm excited about all these fierce women out here. Um, Samira, I'm inspired by Samira. Just the fact that she is 
recognizing that um, we need to police ourselves. Why are men policing women? We know ourselves more than anything else. And we need, um, we need confident young women like Samira out there in the leadership roles. Um, and that's my thing, don't wait. Don't wait, have the best of manners, share of yourself what you have and be willing to absorb the good from anyone else. So that, that's, that's the main thing that I take from everyone. It's, it's been a wild journey for me, something I didn't expect. And like I said, I want that for every other woman out there, just to be able to see, as one of my friends says, do all the things. I just want them to, in, with, within, within, your, within your faith and with your, within your sphere of influence, do all the things. Don't wait. Don't wait. Thank you for your words. Uh, we just want to take, like, before we end, we want to take a few questions from the audience. Um, so, the first question is, what about the judgments and how do you deal with that? So, that question is probably for both of you. Um, like, what are the judgments, like, specific phrases or words that you uh, faced and, like, how did you deal with those? Uh, so, maybe, Samira, you can start. Yes, I can, I can take it. Um, well, uh, when, uh, when Khadija was saying about all the obstacles that from like she was uh, discriminated by black people because why she's Muslim. So I was imagining myself that I was also, you know, judged um, within the movement inside my country in the National Olympic Committee where, you know, they're the leader of the sport in the country. So for me, it was like uh, very difficult. Uh, and it's really difficult that you hear from your trainer that he says, okay, if it was my daughter, I wouldn't allow her to come to do sport. And it's something like a nightmare. Like your trainer is saying, it's not a place, good, good place for my daughter. <laughs> now you ask me how we can, you know, go forward. So it was really, really difficult. But again, that's the message that I said earlier, that I knew that I'm doing the right thing. I knew that this is, this is something that ca can help my country, can unite uh, you know, the, all the, dif uh, the difference uh, within the country. For example, in the national team, people are from very different uh, background, very different race and uh, ethnicity. So some is somebody's from north of the country, some is from the south. So that, that was the only thing that could unite Afghanistan, the people in Afghanistan. So it, for me, it was difficult. For example, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't visit our village uh, in another province for uh, two, 12 years. Why? Because the relatives, they didn't like me and I really didn't want to bother them to go like uh, to their parties or weddings. So it was really difficult, um, but at the end I knew that, well, I was educated. I knew that I'm on the right track. I'm doing the good thing. As I said, if you know, then follow and don't give up. So yeah, it was difficult. It was really difficult. Uh, I was alone for the, uh, in, the, in the beginning when I was working for the National Olympic Committee. I don't say the Ministry of Sport. For the National Olympic Committee, I was the only girl who was working with a man. But because I used to, you know, deal a lot with men, my brothers, first of all. So for me, it was easy. I could go. Um, but again, it needs patience, to be patient. And uh, that, that really helped me. And I was patient. That really helped me. Uh, so it is difficult. But I overcome anyway. So now, today, you see I'm here and I'm happy that I'm advocating and still helping others. And I, and I really uh, feel honored and proud that I could do something that I was suffering in the beginning as a young who, who didn't know the rights and nothing. So yeah, it's a, you know, it's a life to reach here. Right, it's very important to recognize one's own powers and like to be confident enough that what you're doing is right and trying to disregard such judgments. Um, so Khadija, could you tell us what are some judgments you've faced? So, so the three things that I tell myself and the three things that I tell my athletes, um, when people come at you with negativity, the three biggest things you can do is, is, is politeness. Always show the best of manners, persistence, 
you came here to achieve something. You're, it's not your job to take it away from me. It was written for me is mine and nobody can take it away except the law. The last thing is excellence. Nothing shuts anybody up quicker than being good at what you do. I came to race, you came to race. And I've told, told this to all my, you came to race, you've trained, you've put in the same work, just as much, if not more work than they have, show off what you've, what you've done. So those are the three things that, that, that I tell people. It's just be you, be polite in who you are, and show off all the hard work that you've put in because you deserve you deserve it. You deserve the, the the to show off what you've done just as much as anybody else. So those those are the three things, and it's not easy. I've had some crazy things happen, but that's that's why I'm I'm a huge proponent of visualization. Visualize in your mind all the negative things that can happen at a race, as well as all the positive, because those can throw throw your game off a little bit as as well. So just be confident in, in, in who you are. Yeah. Um, so I think we have another question that's coming on from the audience. Um, so Suleha asks, dear Khadija, what's your target for uh, the next triathlon? So um, in the short term, um, I'll be racing. I have Rev3 Williamsburg next week. <laughs> um, and um, I, ITU World Championships, uh, long course in um september and i'll be doing iron man florida in october but longer term um, i want to continue to do the disc program and i, I told my kids i, I want to race till i can't race anymore I, and i definitely want to coach till till i can't speak i i want to i want to be able to coach i love the sport i love what it it does for people i love the community um i'd like to one day coach an all muslim team and take them around the world to race. So those that's shorter term what I'm doing, just you know, getting myself back in the groove of racing. Um, and I, I keep saying this out loud, so I'm gonna have to do it. I I, I want to try to to win an age group national and maybe world title if I can. If a fella has put it and written it for me, that's that's what I'd like to do. So those that's short term, long term, and you know my my dream goals are out there. We hope they happen, all of them. Um, now we're still going to take two more questions, uh, I think. Um, so the next question goes on uh, addressing Samira. It says, how do, you think, how do you think things have changed because of your work? Um, so that makes a little bit touch like, how did your work, after your work, what changed and all that? Um, um, for me, it was... Uh, so I, I can start from Afghanistan because it's been just a few months that I left. Uh, in, uh, it was really in the, in the beginning to step uh, out and to push the national federations because uh, again, it comes to the athletes, both women and men. So, and they are the authority, the national federations who support the athletes. Uh, what I really uh, could do and felt relieved, it was uh, pushing the national federations to have uh, more women in administration uh, section because uh, we never had in Afghanistan. Like uh, we had uh, athletes, but there was not a single female in the administration in the office who could support them. And this was the, the legacy that I could just leave behind just a few months ago uh, which really fa I faced with difficulties even when I was heading to the airport coming here I received calls from different uh, national federation presidents that they were not happy like uh, why I raised it suddenly and it is the best track to do it so if I was gradually telling them they were you know modified they were uh, make it in a different way not to do it but suddenly with a complaint later to the authorities so actually i surprised them that was the best thing that i could do and uh, within the movement bigger in iuc um so we all i, I already said about the uh, strategic plans that iuc have and uh, we are working on that so yeah mm, uh, then uh, yeah, I'm doing like uh, differently in different levels, and it's of course different in different levels. 
wish you the best of luck in your work and your career. Um, so one more question, and that will be it for today. Uh, so it says, Khadija, please share your uh, specs slash designs, details, and how to build your own pool in your background in your backyard. Uh, that's definitely something I was thinking about when you were telling me about the backyard pool. Um, <laughs> so yes, so tell us, I think. The, the sad part is I wish I had like written it all down. It was really just, okay, we have to like build this box and then, but um, the motor itself is an endless pool motor, but really it's it's like building an above ground pool and making sure that the the back wall has enough strength to handle the force of the water coming from the current. So it's, it's and if, if you, both on my Instagram and my Facebook page, there's pictures of it. And what I'll do is I will purposely, over the next days or so, post pictures of them and talk about the different um, pieces of what they call the, the swim can. Everybody calls it the swim can because the outside is made out of stainless steel. It was a lot of fun putting it together. It really was. It took a year and a half, but we did it. <laughs> we will definitely be looking uh, for your content on Instagram, following your pool details. Um, well, that's um, all we have time for today. Uh, remember, you can keep, uh, you can stay connected with the work we're doing at the Muslim Women in Sport through their YouTube channel, as well as, as our Instagram community at Muslim Women Sports Network. Uh, there's also the Twitter and the LinkedIn. I'd like to thank our fantastic panel for their insights and take, uh, taking the time of their precious schedules to spend time with us. And finally, thank you all for joining us today, wherever you are in the world and whatever your time zone is. We hope to see you again in our next summit, uh, hopefully 2022 Muslim Women Sports Summit. Um, and thank you all so much. Thank you.